Uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me. A lot of you um, know that I've been working with Father Griffith both at the parish and also at the University Law School, University of St. Thomas Law School, for the past couple of years. But most of you don't know how I got here. Um, so I'm going to tell you that story. I grew up in St. Paul in a very dysfunctional family and got pregnant at 16 by my grade school boyfriend. Uh, I lied to my parents and uh, went out of the country for an abortion and came back pretending that everything was the same. And it wasn't. I had swept a lot of emotions under the rug. Um, I continued on with my education and graduated from college, ended up in California, um, which is the perfect place to hit rock bottom. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dylan. <laughs> um, and, but the, fortunately, as I said, um, someone came to see me there. And because I was in such distress, I listened to what she had to say to me, which is, there's a better way to live. And as a result of that encounter, I came back to Minnesota, uh, still struggling with my life's direction, but through God's grace and a lot of spiritual direction from this same woman, I was able to regain some self-respect and also a sense of purity. I went to law school. I got married. I Oh, I went to law school. I got a good job. And then I got married and um, had three children. Um, we joined the parish, um, and our children went to the faith formation program here. Um, but I still had this boogeyman um, in my past, and uh, it was a secret that I always thought was going to come up. And I don't think Father's here yet, and he's part of this line, but here it is. <laughs> Um, I always thought it was going to come up and, sorry, Father, bite me in the butt. And um, it kept me in kind of a constant state of hiding. I avoided going into St. Paul because um, that's where the shadows were. Uh, that's where I was bad. Um, that's where the people were that I got in trouble with. And mostly, that was where the painful, shameful memories of my abortion were. Luckily, we had to live in Minneapolis because my husband was an elected official, first of all for Minneapolis and then for Hennepin County. So due to his position, we worked and socialized with many people who were very positive about abortion. Um, all very professional, politically active, and I just kept quiet. <clears throat> Mostly because I didn't know what my position was. I felt conflicted. I felt um, confused. Uh, I felt dishonest in a whole lot of ways, um, kind of regardless of um, who I was with. I, I learned later that this hiding of mine um, was that psychologically, <clears throat> the depth of a trauma, well, I should also say that I kept it to myself where the point, to the point where I didn't even tell my doctors when abortion became legal and they'd ask you, or if on medical forms you would be asked, and I would just lie. And what I learned later about this hiding was that psychologically, the depth of trauma is measured by the extent to which one goes to keep it a secret. And from a spiritual standpoint, I know now that sin wounds and serious sin wounds deeply. <clears throat> I did tell my husband that I had an abortion um, a number of years into our marriage, and I eventually told my mom when I was in college. 
And she never brought it up until about 10 years ago when she was dying. I was taking her to a chemotherapy appointment at the time. And she simply asked me if I dealt with it. Um, I'm like, dealt with it? Um, I just didn't want to go there. Um, she died, and her asking me that, I see now, was really her parting gift to me because it laid on my heart. It stirred up my soul. <laughs> it, um, it led me to prayer, which eventually led me to healing for my abortion, which I did through a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, which is a beautiful vehicle for God's mercy. And the experience of facing the truth of what I had done was very painful. But through it all, I learned a divine paradox that um, when you heal, it hurts. And a lot of times when you hurt, you're healing. Ironically or providentially, the location of the retreat is kept secret until right before you go. And what I found out as I drove up is that it was going to take place in a St. Paul suburb, which was across the street from where I had gone to high school. One of the assignments on the second day of the, treat, of the retreat was to spend some time in your room and think about who you were angry at over your abortion and then bring it back to a small group for discussion. I listed <coughs> me, uh, my parents, my grade school boyfriend, who was who, the father of the child, and I also listed the nuns across the street from the retreat center who, um, at the time when I was in high school, in my adolescent opinion, I thought they should have seen I was in trouble and should have come to my aid. When I left my room to go back for the conversation, I was in an enclosed stairwell at the retreat center going up the stairs and coming down the stairs was a sister who was there, a nun from my high school, there for Eucharistic adoration. Uh, keep in mind I hadn't seen her in 35 years. So I said, are you from, naming my high school, and she said, why yes dear, and she called me by my name, and she asked me how I was doing, and she also asked me how my mom was, who had just passed away shortly before then. This was such an incredible encounter for me, such a, such a deep healing that she recognized me. She had, the retreats are totally private. She didn't know that I would be there. She was there to pray for all the retreatants. But I know that God had sent her to help me as I dealt with the hurt and anger of being abandoned by those whom I wished would have been there for me when I was 16. Her presence was a personal gift of healing that I could hardly take in. Um, I did ask when I got back to my small group if anybody else had run into anybody on their list. And they had. <laughs> um, it, was, um, it was amazing. So, when it came to the part of the retreat where we were to name our children, I chose the name Mercy because I was incredibly immersed in an ocean of it. Father Robert Barron's recent definition of mercy really speaks to me. Mercy, he said, is what love looks like when it turns towards the sinner. Shortly after my retreat, the educational nonprofit that I worked for was, doing, was conducting a legal training explaining new laws and recent court decisions to a conference room full of high school social studies teachers. 
During the presentation of the partial birth abortion case that had been decided <coughs> that year, my coworkers, two women lawyers, made it very clear to the audience that they did not agree with the holding of the case, which allows states to ban the procedure. One of them said in front of the group that it was condescending to women for a justice on the court, a male member of the court, to write in his opinion that some women come to regret their abortions. Whoa. I finally had a reaction, <laughs> and I knew which side I was on. It was like my ears and my eyes had just been opened. <clears throat> um, one of the teachers sitting across from me actually came up to me at the break and asked me if I was okay, so I think I really had a reaction. I wasn't ready to speak up in public then, but part of me just wanted to. Um, however, I did. Um, it was a two-day training and I, I, I went home and I prayed and I prayed the Hail Mary, which was a prayer I struggled with uh, before my healing because of the part of the fruit of her womb. It was hard for me to say. Um, and I went back the next day and um, in the privacy of a coffee room, they asked how I thought the retreat was going. <laughs> and I said, well, I think it's going okay. However, yesterday when you were talking about that case, um, you know, I've had an abortion, and these are women who've known me for years. I've went to law school with them, and, I and they didn't know that. And I regret it, and not only that, I'm so glad they brought it up in that opinion. Good for them. Aside from gaining boldness in my professional life, um, I also became more personally courageous. Again, not long after my retreat, God just kept bringing it on. <coughs> I was invited to my 40th grade school reunion. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually went. I don't know where Joe is, but I drove over the Lake Street Bridge into St. Paul to my old grade school to be with people that I had been avoiding for most of my life. I didn't know if the father of my child would be there. And when I saw that he was, um, there was always a group of people around us, including his wife. Um, and I just said, okay, I'm going along with the program here, Lord. And sure enough, he parted, he being God, parted the Red Sea. And I found myself in a musty kindergarten cloakroom, face to face with my grade school boyfriend, who I had, whom I hadn't seen since we were teenagers, and no one else was around. Um, he asked me how I was doing, and I exclaimed, um, "I've been healed from my abortion." He looked at me and earnestly replied, I am so sorry for all of that. As I accepted his apology, I saw a weight lift from his shoulders, and on the way home from the reunion, it occurred to me that this grace-filled experience of God's mercy might have been a healing for him as well. Mm. And he recently died. So. Mm. The deepening of my faith produced a dramatic transformation in my behavior, uh, which was a concern to my family. <laughs> As I drew closer to God, they felt I was pulling away from them. I remember our teenage daughter complaining to her dad about this, and in response, he said, I think the train has left the station here. <laughs> Which it had, um, due to my now solidified views on particularly abortion. 
it was really hard for me to be, to keep up the same social, political, and personal life that we lived and I lived prior to what I now call my conversion. Although also incredibly difficult for my husband, <clears throat> he supported me through this process, accompanying me to many Catholic events. He's here tonight. <laughs> while attending lots of political functions on his own. He supported my leaving the job I was in, which I did, and he accepted my almost manic quest to learn more about my faith through reading and ultimately by joining the first class of the Catechetical Institute at the St. Paul Seminary. Um, Tom also helped me um, with many papers for that program, um, with many other assignments, uh, for instance, for Father Griffith's Catholic Social Teaching class, and um, actually with this presentation as well. So, thank you, Tom. During the time I was getting my spiritual life in order, I was also looking for a job consistent with my emerging world views. I applied for a number of positions at the Archdiocese and came close a couple of times, but the door did not open. As a matter of fact, the last time I did, it slammed so hard, I thought I'd get a nosebleed. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, okay, um, I'm just going to put my energies elsewhere and um, get my house in order, which I literally did um, by uh, putting our house on the market up in the Marcy Holmes neighborhood, a few blocks from here, um, selling it, it's where we raised our children, selling it and moving um, down to a condominium uh, closer to the river and to the parish. Shortly after we settled in, the new pastor, Father Griffith, asked me if I was interested in working with him at Our Lady of Lourdes. I knew God was calling me to work for the church. I just didn't know which one. I think that was why I kept getting no's over there in St. Paul, and lo and behold, here it was, right nearby. Well, now you know how I got here. You should also know that in preparing for this talk, I vacillated between feeling really confident that I had so much to share with you about that would help you live your faith in the world <laughs> to um, feeling like I had nothing to offer you at all and diving deep into insecurity. But this useless mental banter um, didn't last too long. I reminded myself, because someone had reminded me about this, that the perpetual lie of the evil one is that we are not good enough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Through my healing and the abundance of his mercy, God taught me who I really am, although sometimes I forget. He taught me that I'm a beloved child of his, whole and open to my true vocation. God assured me that instead of trying to impress you with my life, I simply needed to get out of the way and tell you my story, which is really his story. It's a story full of hope for even the biggest sinner. Thank you.